one woman, one woman who forgot to record it until halfway were in the presentation. Anyway, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kelly, who uh, has left um, and is in Chester County. And I think that uh, I did something uh, in Chester, Pennsylvania, uh, that got me in the movie called Sons of Ben about the Chester uh, soccer team, the Philadelphia Union soccer team. So that's one thing I've done in the Philadelphia area. Anyway, my name is Evan Weiner. Uh, my background is journalism, TV, radio, newspapers, magazines. And uh, I do a lot of talks. I do about uh, 250 talks a year. And this one isn't uh, called for all that much. It, usually in September and October, people say, hey, you got anything about uh, the 1919 World Series fix? I said, yeah, I do. And uh, I do it maybe twice a year. And it's always fresh for me. And it's always somewhat laughable for me because this was a somewhat laughable case. That you are looking at is the Chicago White Sox. 1919 world championship team and it's a team that uh, may have bet uh, or may have uh, played around with syndicates to throw the world series they wouldn't be the first uh, collection of baseball players to throw games and maybe not the last but the black Sox of uh, 1919 left uh, a scar on baseball. And there was also a book that came out called Eight Men Out, which probably is in the library, which may or may not be uh, a, a truthful account of what happened. And that spawned the movie Eight Men Out. 1919, Chicago White Sox, uh, were, they were, uh, <laughs> they were uh, called the Black Sox, not because they did anything bad, but their uniforms were dirty. The best of nine World Series featured the Chicago White Sox in the Cincinnati Reds, and it was fixed. Just how that happened has never been fully established. And we are 102 years from there. Um, there have been various accounts, but none seemed to jive with a real story. But it wasn't baseball's first fix. It wasn't baseball's first fix at all. The American League champion, the Chicago White Sox team, won 88 games. They only played 154 games in those days. Uh, so they win 88 games to get into the 1919 World Series, but they would lose to the Cincinnati Reds. Now, how did uh, people find out that this thing was fixed? Well, it was an open secret in Chicago, but nobody ever bothered with it. There was a, a grand jury being seated for another possible fixed game between the Philadelphia Phillies and the Chicago Cubs. And during that grand jury, it was learned that a handful of Chicago White Sox players were found to have taken money from gamblers in return for throwing the World Series. Chick Gandell, the first baseman, supposed to be the ringleader. Eddie Sicotti, who won 28 games that year. He was a great pitcher that year for Chicago. Shoeless Joe Jackson, did he or did he not throw the World Series is a question still being debated 102 years later. He got thrown out of baseball for it. Uh, Swede Riceberg and Buck Weaver. Buck Weaver, he was thrown out of baseball and he missed out on a big business opportunity with Walgreens. I'll get into that a little later. Uh, this is Lefty Williams, one of the pitchers, a left-handed pitcher, hence Lefty. Fred McMullen, Hap Felsch, who was an infielder. Now, like I said, this is not the first time that a uh, baseball game was thrown. In the early days of professional baseball, now professional baseball started in 1869 with the Cincinnati Reds baseball team. Everybody got paid on that team. Uh, Lippin Pike got paid in 1868. He was supposed to be the first professional player, but players took money wherever they could get it, under the table, from gamblers, clerks, whatever. In the early days of professional baseball, crooked play was not uncommon, and many players were suspected of throwing games in exchange for money. In fact, there was a league called the National Association, and gambling undermined it in the early 1870s. The National League, of which the Philadelphia Phillies are a member today. William Hulbert formed the National League in 1876. His intention, drive gambling out of the game. Uh, Bosch Tweed, Tammany Hall, New York. 
Bosch Twig was involved in the early days of baseball and he was so corrupt. Why not be corrupt in baseball too? In 1865, there was a betting scandal involving the New York Mutuals, a professional team organized by Tammany Hall boss, William Mager Tweed, better known as Bosch Tweed. Thomas Deaver, William Wansley, and Edward Duffy claimed they were victimized by a wicked conspiracy. They were all banned from baseball for accepting $100 apiece to throw a game against the Eckfords of Brooklyn. New York Mutual players played in Hoboken, New Jersey. Brooklyn was a separate city. I have no idea why they played in Hoboken. Eventually, all three would be reinstated. John Ratcliffe, he was expelled from baseball for offering an umpire $175 in 1874. And when you think of $175 in 1874, that probably is about uh, 400, $450 today, something like that, maybe more, to help the Chicago White Stockings win a game. Bill Creaver, member, uh, Craver rather, member of the Louisville Braves, 1877. This team was really good, but somehow they lost seven games in a row. And this is a really good team, and why have they lost seven games in a row? Well, they were investigating this team, and they found out gamblers had bought off George Hall, Bill Craver, Al Nichols, Jim Delvin, and the National League founder, 1780, or rather 1876, William A. Hobart banned all of them from baseball. Now, the players claimed that they had to throw the games because they weren't getting paid. They weren't getting paid because the owner of the Louisville team had failed to meet payroll obligations. They begged for forgiveness. They were never reinstated, and the Louisville Graves faded, in, Graves faded into history. Uh, they fold after that season, possibly because of the fix. More than likely, the ownership lost money, big money, $2,000. Over the next few decades, there were fewer suspicions of game fixing in professional baseball. But it was there. Dick Hyman, the uh, Detroit Wolves owner, William Thompson, became suspicious of that umpire's call against his team. And he hired the detective to find out what Bill was all about. Well, there were several letters between Hyam and a well-known gambler that were found. Hyam outlined a simple code for the gamblers. If a gambler received a telegram from him saying, buy all the lumber you can, it meant the gambler should bet on Detroit. No telegram meant that the gambler was to bet on the opponent. John J. McGraw, Baseball Hall of Fame, member of the Baltimore Orioles of the 1890s that kind of revolutionized the way the game was played. Uh, John J. McGuire becomes the manager of the New York Giants and um, kind of does what Pete Rose did. And Pete Rose got thrown out of baseball for it, bet on his own team. In 1905, the New York Giants manager, John McGuire, wins $400 betting on his team to win the 1905 World Series. Now, the World Series started in 1903. Boston played Pittsburgh. But uh, McGuire's team won the National League in 1904. But eh, nah, 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 nah. we're not playing. He says, we're not playing. So they didn't play. Why? Because uh, McGuire hated the American League president, Van Johnson, because Johnson suspended McGuire for boorish on-field behavior during his tenure as an American League manager. So I'll show you. We're not going to have a World Series. But he comes back in 1905 and does exactly what Pete Rose did. He bets on his own team, and he wins. Uh, McGraw agreed to take on the Philadelphia Athletics, Connie Mack's team, who won the American League in, 19, in 1905. Uh, the New York Giants beat the A's in five games. McGraw got his money, and he got his revenge on Van Johnson. Kind of an interesting nickname, Van. He banned somebody for the sport for betting. Pete Rose was banned for betting, right? But McGraw was not thrown out of baseball for betting. Oh, look at this guy. This guy's Jack O'Connor. He's the manager of the St. Louis Americans of the American League. He's a cat on his feet, a glutton for work, and full of aggressiveness when he was a player. And now he's one of the quickest thinkers and most daring 
and aggressive managers in the league, and he drinks Coca-Cola. And no wonder he likes Coca-Cola. He's like Coca-Cola, full of vim, vigor, and go. You like it. It's delicious, refreshing, thirst quenching. Five cents everywhere. So this guy's drinking Coca-Cola. It's a good guy, right, for the ad? and sell Coca-Cola. But uh, there's something more sinister here. He and Harry Hell, who is his coach, uh, they conspire to make sure that Ty Cobb doesn't win the American League batting title. So O'Connor and Hal, the manager and coach of St. Louis Browns, are banned in 1910 or after the 1910 season for attempting to fix the outcome of the 1910 American League batting title for the Cleveland Indians player who they wanted to win, Matt Lejoy, against Ty Cobb. Uh, basically, in those games, it was a little ball game. It was, you know, choking up on the bat, hitting, you know, hit them where they ain't, as Willie, Willie Keeler said. Uh, bunts, all that kind of stuff, not like today's game, which is home run and strikeouts. That's all it is right now. Launch, you know, launch angle and all that stuff. So um, that game was filled with bunts, and they did not play a defense to uh, against Napoli Joe um, that would, would make it more difficult to get bunt hits. Oh, and there is also another thing uh in this thing uh o'connor and hal tried to bribe an official scorer who was a woman to change an error to a hit how'd they do that they said hey if you if you change it to a hit we'll buy you a whole new wardrobe that's what we'll do apparently they had money on the show now here is arnold rothstein Arnold Rothstein put the organized in organized crime. He was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guy and often didn't leave too many fingerprints behind. And that's Charles Comiskey. Uh, and he is in Baseball's Hall of Fame and he was the owner of the Chicago White Sox in 1919. The scheme is simple. The White Sox players don't like Comiskey. They thought he should pay them more money. In retrospect, if you look, at uh, the monies paid to all the players back in 1919, uh, Chicago White Sox, they made some money. It wasn't like they were at the bottom of the, of the barrel. They made some money. The White Sox had a first baseman, Chick Kandel, and uh, he knew a gambler by the name of Joseph Sports Sullivan. And this is 1919. And they meet to discuss the possibility of Sox players throwing the championship. Now, gamblers and baseball players had a long history of being friendly. Let's say that. Gamblers had been long greasing the palms of disgruntled ball players in exchange for inside tips to bet. It's illegal betting, but to bet. And um, sometimes they won, sometimes they lost. But, you know, here's 25 bucks. Tell me who's injured. Gindel, um claim that he was initially skeptical that this scheme, this little plan could work, but he eventually agreed that he and a few co-conspirators would throw the World Series in exchange for a hefty payout of around $100,000. And if it's eight guys, it's $12,000, which was a lot of money back in 1919. The promised payoff, $100,000. Gandell got uh, the pitchers, Eddie uh, Sicati and Claude Lefty Williams involved. Also, uh, the shortstop, Charles Swede Weisberg, and the outfielder, Oski Happy Felch, into the scheme. Now, the third baseman, Buck Weaver, was in on the early stages of the plot, but he said, I'm not doing this. However, the utility infielder, Fred McMullen, was cut in after he overheard the players talking about the deal. Shoeless Joe Jackson was also approached. And there is Sports Sullivan. He's going to be one of the guys who's going to be putting up money or greasing the palms of players in exchange for tips or throw the whole World Series. Now, uh, Sports Sullivan was the brains of the operation. Um, he gets a whole bunch of crooks. Sleepy Bill Burns, Bill Myhart, former boxer by the name of Abe Battelle, and they begin to raise the bribe money. Now, the New York mob leader, Arthur uh, Arnold uh, Rothstein, who put the organized and organized crime, may have been a major player in this thing. He 
it may have been because he won a lot of money doing this, but his involvement for some reason was never proven. And the evidence that there is evidence that Gandell and co-conspirators went all over the place, had multiple deals, with multiple syndicates, all small fry, you know, all guys off the street, and they just sold the games. We're going to throw it to whoever gave them money. And there is Attell, who is a boxer uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, this is what Attell claimed. They not only sold the series, but they sold it wherever they could get a buck. Bookies had previously had the Sox winning the World Series over the underdog Cincinnati Reds by as much as three to one odds. But the odds start to shift because those in the know begin betting heaps of cash on the Cincinnati Reds. Doesn't seem that this is this deal is all that secret. A lot of the people seem to know what's going on. As the championship grew near, the streets buzzed with rumors that several White Sox players were in the pocket of high-stake gamblers. Well, it wasn't high-stake gamblers. It was two-bit hoods. But, uh, well, that was the rumor. The eight were ready. Fix these faces in your memory. Pat Felsch, Chick Gandell, Joe Jackson, Eddie Sicotti, Claude Williams, Fred McMullen, Sweet Riceboat, and Buck Weaver. Eight men charged with selling out baseball. We're underway. It's the 1919 World Series. It's the Cincinnati Reds against the Chicago White Sox. And uh, Eddie Sicotti is on the mound for the White Sox. And uh, he's giving a single to all the hoods in the hoodlums. After hitting a batter with one of his first pitches, supposedly a sign that the fix was on, Eddie Sicotti went on to make a series of uncharacteristic blunders from the mound. Chicago loses the game nine to one in the New York Times. The New York Times breathlessly reports, never before in the history of America's biggest baseball spectacle has a pennant winning club received such a disastrous drubbing in an opening game. Faulty play continued in game two. Lefty Williams gifted the Reds a 4-2 win after walking three batters in a row. And the whispers are becoming louder and louder and louder. It's Christy Matthewson, the great pitcher with the New York Giants during the century, who went to uh, World War I. He's the manager of the Cincinnati team, but served in World War I, got hit with mustard plaster, destroyed his life, and his life was snuffed out rather young because of that uh, in the 1920s. But he's around because uh, he's being paid uh, to report on what's going on. Um, the plot to throw the series was not a well kept secret. Players, gamblers, and sports writers frequented the same hotels, bars, and other hangouts. Hugh Fullerton of the Chicago Herald and Examiner and Christy Matthewson they had it all figured out before the first game. Fulton later said he was approached by, he approached Charles Comiskey, the owner, with his suspicions, and Comiskey waved him off. Uh, Cincinnati is winning four games to one. You need five games to win. After game five, players did not get their money. Didn't get their money. And they told the gamblers, we're done. You didn't give us our money, we're playing the next two games on the level. And the White Sox win game six and game seven. That makes it a 4-3 series. Now, Chicago still has to win two more. There's game eight. One of the gamblers allegedly threatened to kill Lefty Williams and his wife if the Sox won game eight. So the pitcher threw the game and the series. So the Reds win game eight rather easily, although you know, the Reds had some Hall of Fame players. And there could be an argument that the Reds did win fairly and squarely. Could be that argument, um, particularly the way Joe Jackson played. Uh, what were the reasons for the White Sox players to throw the games? Well, the owner, Charles Comiskey, was widely known as a skin flint to the point where he charged the players for cleaning their own uniforms. And then there was Sakati. He was promised a $5,000 bonus if he won through the games. Gets to 29. 
doesn't ditch. Comiskey doesn't get the, the bonus. The players' meager salaries left some players open to the influence of gamblers. But like I said, you look at uh, payments out per team, Chicago's in the middle of the pack. Uh, a, a 1920 Eddie Sakati deposition, when he was deposed, was on display as a historic artifact in Chicago a couple of years ago at Todd Montana. In it, uh, Sakati says the 1919 White Sox players had heard of a bribe of $10,000 to one or more of the Chicago Cub players. That was the World Series between the Chicago Cubs and the Boston Red Sox, which the Red Sox won behind the left arm of Babe Ruth, the great pitcher. He won 88 games as a pitcher. And he started hitting home runs uh, when he was uh, 25 years old in 1920. Uh, so Scotty claims they went on 1918. Here's Rothstein. Rothstein was asked to finance the bribery of several of the White Sox players. In the end, the White Sox threw the series. Rothstein doesn't have any of his fingerprints on this thing, but seemed to know what was going on because allegedly he won about $350,000 betting on the Cincinnati Reds. There's an investigation, and it reveals that Abe Battelle, a friend and employee of Rothstein's, was involved in making payments to the White Sox players. Rothstein said, no, 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 it wasn't me. I was never involved. I was never involved. I was never involved. He was never indicted. What really happened? Well, we think the World Series was fixed. Those guys said they would. But uh, stories, 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 stories. Trying to pin down the right story becomes difficult because Rothstein had his story. Attell had his story. Others, they had their stories. Nobody ever gave a straight story. The fix was uncovered absolutely by accident by a grand jury investigating a game between the Chicago Cubs and the Philadelphia Phillies. Oh, there were suspicions that the 1919 World Series was rigged. He said it was an open secret going through Chicago. Christy Matthewson had it. He talked about it former manager of the of uh, the uh, Cincinnati Reds, who was working for a newspaper at the time. But uh, all seemed to be forgotten as the 1920 season started. And uh, like all previous World Series, they all fade into oblivion. Here today, gone tomorrow. But um, there were still investigations on baseball and a particular game between the Cubs and the Phillies. And they wanted to look at it, the grand jury and the investigators. And, well, the grand juries convened to investigate, and somehow the speculation turns back to the World Series of 1919. Around the same time, the gambler, Phil Marhan, goes public with an account of his own involvement in the fix on August 31st, 1920. Eddie Scotty decided to testify before the grand jury. The White Sox picture, picture said, I don't know why I did it. I needed the money. I had a wife and kids. Shortly afterwards, the star hitter, guy who was a Hall of Fame player, Shoeless Joe Jackson, testified and admitted to having accepted $5,000 from his teammates. Over the next few days, Lefty Williams, Oscar Felch also confessed their involvement. On October 22nd, 1920, the grand jury handed down its indictments, naming the eight Chicago players, five gamblers, including Bill Burns and Sports Sullivan and Abe Attell. But Rothstein's not indicted. He would have the brains to do this. He would be the guy. He could be the mastermind, but he's not indicted. The indictments included nine counts of conspiracy to defraud various individuals and institutions. But the indictments are very, very, very vague, very vague. The judge, Hugo Friend, charged the jury, told them that he told them that to return a guilty verdict, they must find that the players conspired to defraud the public and others, not merely throw baseball games. So who were they defrauding? That was a question. On August 2nd, 1921. The Black Sox players were found not guilty on all counts. The players' vindication would not last very long. The day after the acquittal, 
Judge Kenneth Sura Mountain Landis, who always said, well, ask the owners, at least when it came to uh, desegregating baseball, not my decision, but he was recently appointed as baseball's first commissioner, and he decreed that all eight players were permanently banned from organized baseball. Okay, uh, before you ban them, you think you might want to read the grand jury testimony? Well, they might, except it was lost. There's Landis. Landis said, regardless of the verdict of juries, no player who throws a ball game, no player that undertakes or promises to throw a ball game, no player that sits in conference with a bunch of crooked players and gamblers where the ways and means of throwing a game are discussed and does not promptly tell his club about it will ever play professional baseball. There's a guy who knew about it and got thrown out of baseball, uh, Joe Gideon. He was a friend of Swede Weisberg, and he was present during a meeting with the gamblers as they were discussing the plot to fix the 1919 World Series. He was later called as a witness in the trial. On November 3rd, 1921, Gideon was banned for life from organized baseball, or as they used to call it, OB, uh, for having guilty knowledge of the Black Sox scandal. Uh, History's Mysteries. Actually, I was on a TV show called History's Mysteries in 1999 with Frank DeFord and Al Michaels. It was on the History Channel. It was awful, terrible. 88 minutes, the entire world of sports in 88 minutes. Just an awful show. But at least they got a video out of it. Anyway, paper records relating to the players' grand jury confessions vanished. Really mysterious circumstances. Nobody ever found out what happened to those papers. Well, here's a question. Did Comiskey or Rothstein arrange for the papers to be stolen as part of the cover-up? Also, the prosecution's case disappeared along with the confessions. What happened? Why isn't there a written record? There's no written record. Uh, Chick Endell gave an interview to Sports Illustrated 37 years after the fact, and he decided to maybe come clean. Eight men were out on September 28th, 1920. They were suspended for life. Uh, they were suspended at that point. Landis is named commissioner, and he had helped baseball with a ruling uh, in, to get their antitrust exemption uh, in a case uh, against by the Maryland Terrapins against the National League of Baseball. He ruled, ruled in favor of the National League. So they liked him, and they made him commissioner to clean up the game. It would not be the last betting scandal. Gandell, 1956 Sports Illustrated interview, when Sports Illustrated was a real magazine as opposed to what it is today. Had real writers. They had a high school writer for that high school in his basement. He was writing for Sports Illustrated. Anyway, uh, that was two years ago. Anyway, Gindel frankly admitted that was a ringleader. They were all interested and thought we should recontour to see if the dough would really be put on the line. Weaver suggested we get paid in advance. Then if things got too hot, we could double cross the gambler, keep the cash, take the big end of the series, the money, uh, the winner's share, by beating the Reds. We agreed this was one hell of a brainy plan. <laughs> no, it wasn't, but they thought it was. So what happened to all the characters? Well, after Sakati's thrown out of baseball, he worked briefly as a Michigan game warden and then got a job with Henry Ford at Ford Motor Company. Uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson became really successful after baseball, very, very successful after baseball. Played some semi-pro ball, and then uh, he was in North Carolina and South Carolina and opened up businesses in the Carolinas, operating a liquor store, a barbecue restaurant, and the dry cleaners. He did rather well. Uh, Ty Cobb went to uh, through town and went uh, to see one of, uh, to buy something, and he did see uh, Joe Jackson. He said, aren't you Joe Jackson? No, no, no. Ty thought that uh, he was just ashamed of what happened. Uh, Lefty Williams and uh, Fred McMullen, uh, I was going to say Fred McMurray, Fred McMullen both lived quiet lives in California for decades after the scandal. Swede Reisberg opened a successful nightclub near the California-Oregon border and spent the final years living with his son Robert in Red Bluff, California. In 1970, he wrote a column 
to preview the World Series as a guest columnist for a local newspaper. His columns were short, amiable, but there was no mention of the past. Oh, by the way, it was the Baltimore uh, Orioles against the Cincinnati Reds in the 1970 World Series, and uh, Reisberg picked the Cincinnati Reds, ironically, 51 years later. Uh, Buck Weaver. Buck Weaver is an interesting story. He's out of baseball, but he takes a job with the city of, uh, of Chicago as a day painter, and he gets involved in, with a drugstore business. His brother-in-law was a pharmacist, a guy by the name of William Scanlon. And he opens up six drugstores on the south side of Chicago, and they're doing very, very, very well. Uh, and then uh, Walgreens decides, we'd like to buy out Charles Walgreens. We'd like to buy out. Give you a lot of money. And they say, no, no, no. Uh, Walgreens. Drugstore Empire was about ready to skyrocket, and he wanted Scallion and uh, Scallion and Weaver to join him as junior partners. He said, no, big mistake. Second big mistake in Weaver's career. Uh, the Great Depression hit, Scallion and Weaver closed their stores. In the mid-1920s, Gandell played with Hal Chase, Buck Weaver, Lefty Williams, and other banished players in a league called the Copper League. Had teams near the U.S. Mexican border, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Uh, in the early 1930s, Gindel and his wife settled in Berkeley, California, and he worked mostly as a plumber. And I could use a plumber. Maybe I should get a hold of him. In 1962, Felsch, who was 70 years old, retired as a crane operator for the George Meyer Company. His family uh, recalled him uh, and uh, remembered him enduringly as always being in a good mood. Card playing, bowling, hunting, fishing, smoking, and coffee drinking. How many vices are there? Smoking and smoking, I guess. Card playing, maybe. Where his favorite pastimes? And when he was uh, when he wasn't doing that, he was listening to Earl Gillespie and Milwaukee Braves baseball. Comiskey continued as owner of the White Sox until his death in 1931. Eight years later, he's elected into baseball's Hall of Fame. There are other guys who were thrown out of baseball too. Hal Chase, the fearless leader, Prince Hal. Hal Chase was a great hitter who it was believed threw games in his 15 year career, but it was never proven. However, after the 1919 season, he played with the New York Giants, he was unofficially banned from major leagues before Landis got there. And then he goes to the Pacific Coast League, where you can actually make some money in the Pacific Coast League. Um, and uh, he's banned from that league uh, because he tried to buy, bribe an umpire. Uh, his teammate with the 1912 New York Giants was a great hitter, Heine Zimmerman. He won, uh, he led the league in home runs, batting average, and runs batted in. And he's barred from baseball after the 1919 season for fixing games in his past. The babe comes along, and he literally saves baseball. Literally saves baseball because uh, he hits the home run. Uh, one reporter talked about babe, and this is after the whole White Sox scandal comes down, and how babe saved the game. He's writing, one reporter wrote. Uh, this new fan didn't know where first base was, but he heard the Babe Ruth and he wanted to see him in a home run. When the Babe hit one, the fan went back the next day and knew not only where first base was, but where second base was as well. Another guy who got uh, canned, Gene Paulette. Gene Paulette, permanently banned from baseball. Why? He allegedly received gifts from St. Louis gamblers and offered to throw some games early in the 1919 season. See, uh, in 1919, 1919, a lot of this was going on just because it was the World Series, big deal. There was a lot of games that uh, were being thrown. Uh, that was 1919. Jimmy O'Connell, another guy who gets tossed. This is five years later. There's no excuse for this. This is five years later, but in the final series of the 1924 season, the New York Giants playing the Philadelphia Phillies again. They're in uh, Manhattan at the Polo Grounds, and they're battling for the pennant with the Brooklyn Dodgers. O'Connell offers the Phillies shortstop, Heine Sand, $500 to throw the games. 
Sam rejected the bribe, reported to the Phillies manager, Art Fleischer. Uh, and that would lead to the permanent suspension of O'Connell and the Giants coach, Cozy Dolan by uh, Landis. Uh, but uh, the good players seem to, uh, the good players seem to escape because the future Hall of Famers, Frankie Frisch and George Kelly and Rush Youngs, well, they were implicated, but nothing happened to them. And then there's another one. And this goes back to maybe 1919 World Series. Ty Cobb and Tris Speaker. Ty Cobb was, last couple of years of his career was with the Philadelphia Phillips. 1926, Ty Cobb and Tris Speaker were permitted by Van Johnson. He's back again, the guy who suspended McGraw back in the 1890s. They're uh, permitted by Van Johnson to resign from baseball near the end of the 1926 season after a former pitcher by the name of Dutch Leonard charged that Cobb Speaker and Smokey Joe Wood had joined him just before the 1919 World Series in betting on a game that they knew. Cobb Speaker, Smokey Joe Wood, Speaker also a Hall of Famer, Smokey Joe Wood blew out his arm. He might have been a Hall of Famer too. Uh, they've been on the game. They knew that was fixed in 1919. Leonard had these letters and other documents that he was going to give to Van Johnson. And Johnson thought they would be so potentially damning to baseball in the wake of the Black Sox scandal that uh, he paid Leonard $20,000 to go away. We don't want to hear this. We don't want to hear about this. Here's 20 grand. That's a lot of money in 1926. Landis exposed the cover-up, and eventually there was a fallout that forced Johnson out of his position as president of the league he created. Cobb and Speaker vehemently denied any wrongdoing. They were big stars. Well, Cobb was. So was Speaker. And uh, Landis eventually let both players remain in baseball because they had not been found guilty of fixing any games themselves. The last guy that was uh, banned from baseball because of betting, uh, was the Philadelphia Phillies owner, William Cox. That was uh, during um, the Second World War. He was banned in 1943 for betting on his team's games. Uh, Cox also wanted to rename the team the Philadelphia Blue Jays. Uh, they're still the Phillies. Uh, Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays, they're both thrown out of baseball. They're not betting on baseball, but you know, Mickey might have drank himself out of baseball. Well, he never did. But Willie and Mickey, and Willie is 90 years old now, uh, were thrown out of baseball. 1979, Willie Mays is looking for money. He's not playing baseball anymore. And he signs as an ambassador for an Atlantic City casino. In 1983, which I believe is a year after, Mickey Mantle had an elementary school named after him in New York City, which I passed yesterday on uh, on, um, what was it, um, Amsterdam Avenue and uh, 82nd Street. Mantle did the same for another casino. Each was paid $100,000. The commissioner, Bowie Kuhn, said, hey, they're hanging out with known gamblers. Threw them out of the game. But they weren't hanging out with known gamblers, per se. They're playing golf with high rollers. Peter Uberoff, Good old P.U., as we used to call him. Peter Ubrot, commissioner of baseball from 1984 to about 1988. Good old P.U. Um, there was literally nothing damning there. They played golf at the casino sponsored outings of celebrities. They were at casino boulevards, boulevards rather, uh, promoting the golf events, not gambling. <laughs> Wasn't even close. No umpire needed. Uh, good old P.U. restored them, Peter Ubrot. And that brings us to Pete Rose. Pete Rose did the same exact thing that John J. McGraw did. We don't know how many times McGraw actually did that in his career, bet on his own team. But we got kind of an idea from John Dowd, who I was covering this back in 1989, who was one of the, well, let's just put it this way. I didn't like dealing with him. He didn't like dealing with me. Uh, it was Bart Giamatti, it was Pete Rose, it was Faye Vincent, it was John Dowd, who always looked like he needed Tums. Um, and Dowd was this Washington lawyer who came in and steamrolled everything and made sure he tried to steamroll reporters too. Um, you know, that was back then. And uh, Major League Baseball Rule 21D, 
any player, umpire, or club, or league official, or employee who shall bet on any sum whatsoever upon the baseball game in connection which, with which the better has a duty to perform shall be declared permanently ineligible. Now, there was no evidence that was ever discovered that Pete Rose bet against the Cincinnati Reds when he managed them. There's no investigation ever of John J. McGraw. This is the only parallel that I could give you back then. But Rose did have betting slips written in his own handwriting, as well as other evidence, to indicate that he only bet on certain Reds games. Uh, I was working uh, sports in New York City during the 1980s, and it was a thing called Sports Phone, 976-1313-212, uh, which was, as Joe Safety, who was working with the New York Yankees in the public relations department at the time, said was a conduit for betting. And he was right. And I can tell you that Pete Rose had the inside number at sports phone to find out what was going on, because this is obviously the days before the internet. Uh, Rose was informally questioned in February 1989 by the Commissioner of Baseball, Peter Ubroth, and the National League President, A. Bartlett Giamatti. The less said about him, the better as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Rose vehemently denied the allegations. By this time, MLB owners had elected Giamatti to succeed. Ubroth and the outgoing commissioner said, hey, Bart, it's all yours. You deal with it. And he went on to uh, become the uh, owner of all the Doubletree uh, hotels in the United States, Peter Ubroth. Sports Illustrated, when it was a legitimate magazine, gave the public their first detailed report of the allegation that Rose had Place bets on baseball, March 21st, 1989. Oh, there's John Dowd, one of the sourest people I've ever met in my life and ever interviewed in my life. John Dowd interviewed many of Rose's associates, including alleged bookies and bet runners. He delivered a summary of his finding to the commissioner, Giamatti, in May of 1989. In it, uh, Dowd documented Rose's alleged gambling activities in 1985, 1986, compiled a day-to-day -day account of Rose's alleged betting on baseball games in 1987. The Dowd Report, oh, I remember it well, I had to read it. The Dowd Report documented his alleged bets on 52 Reds games in 1987. Rose put up $10,000 a day in betting. On August 23rd, 1989, Pete Rose agreed to a lifetime ban from Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball agreed to make no formal finding with regard to the gambling allegations, although John Dowd made a career out of saying Pete Rose bet on baseball. But then again, Dowd was not employed anymore by Major League Baseball. On the outside, looking in, 4,192 hits, all-time leader in Major League Baseball. He's ineligible to be enshrined in Baseball's Hall of Fame. He's had limited official contact with uh, baseball since 1989, did some baseball games on TV, was honored as one of the great players of the 20th century. And there is a debate whether he should be in the Hall of Fame. The same debate as to whether Shulis Joe Jackson should be in the Hall of Fame or not. Was Shulis Joe Jackson part of it or not? We don't know because in 1920, uh, the grand jury all the, the paperwork from the grand jury mysteriously disappeared. Roger Kahn, baseball writer, went back to the 1950s, wrote a biography of Rose called My Story, Pete Rose, My Story, 1989. Kahn kept asking him, did you bet our baseball, yes or no? Rose always responded thusly. Kahn says, I have too much respect for the game. Several years after the book came out, Rose told an interviewer, yeah, I've been on baseball. Roger Kahn said, I wanted to bomb it. Got paid for the book. The book may be in the library. Uh, betting scandals, not limited to baseball. It's point shaving in basketball, CCNY. Great uh, team out of New York, City College of New York. Uh, 32 college basketball players from seven schools, including CCNY. Uh, around the country were caught up in a point-shaving scandal. There were four schools in New York, three out-of-state schools, including Kentucky. Uh, the accused players had been on CCNY's 1950 team, which became the first and only team ever to win NCAA championship and an NIT championship. 
they didn't throw the games. They were just shaving points off for betters. Uh, the NFL, uh, Pete Rozelle, 1963, suspended Paul Horning and Alex Karras for betting on NFL games. Betting on NFL games. One year suspension. And they came back. Uh, they routinely would bet up to $500 on NFL games associating with known gamblers. In issuing his indefinite suspension, Roselle, the NFL commissioner, Alvin Pete Roselle, Alvin Roy Pete Roselle, Pete was a nickname, took care of the mention that neither player bet on or against their own teams. Suspension over after a year. And then there was Tim Donahue, uh, the uh, NBA referee shown here with Michael Jordan, who's been known to uh, spend some time in Atlantic City casinos and gambling on the golf course. In 2007, an FBI investigation revealed that uh, Donahue, the longtime referee, had bet on NBA games, fed information to other gamblers after falling into debt. Uh, then there's the Hawk and others. These guys weren't even involved with gambling. Connie Hawkins, the great schoolboy basketball player in the city of New York, goes to the University of Iowa, and he's thrown out after his first year. There's a point-shaving case involving a former player from Columbia University named Jack Molinas, who was brilliant, like Rothstein, and like Rothstein, met an untimely death. Hawkins had not been charged of doing anything wrong except hanging out with some people he should have avoided. He never played a game at Iowa. The others, uh, Doug Moe, Roger Brown, all of them ended up in the American Basketball Association because the NBA commissioner, Walter Kennedy, did not want him in there in his league. Brown and Hawkins ended up, well, Hawkins came back to the NBA. Brown played his whole career in the ABA, American Basketball Association. There are two Hall of Famers. Oh, remember this guy, Henry Hill. Henry Hill, Lufthansa. Uh, hijacking or the Latanza Hest at uh, JFK K Airport. The Goodfellas might have seen that movie. The Dixie Basketball Scandal, 1961. That was a scandal. The Boston College Basketball Point Shaving Scandal, 1978-79, perpetrated by the gangsters Henry Hill, Jimmy Burke, Tulane Men's Basketball sh Point Shaving Scandal of 84-85. Uh, the program was gone for four years. Goodfellas, Henry Hill, born in Brooklyn, New York, June 11, 1943. He worked his way up in the Lucchese crime family from a young age. He was addressed, arrested for drug trafficking in 1980, uh, became a federal informant, joined the witness protection program for a number of years. Hill's life is the basis of the 1990 Martin Scorsese movie called Goodfellas. And now we have a legalized sports gambling, and it's all over. In the state of Connecticut, it is probably going to start legalized sports gambling this week or next week. Uh, leagues for years and years worried about uh, athletes associating with gamblers. They didn't want a 1919 World Series again. Uh, the NHL didn't want two people thrown out of the league for betting on games in 1948. A guy named Gallagher and a guy named Taylor. The NBA, they didn't even touch Connie Hawkins, and he had nothing to do with the point shaving scandal that was going on. Um, so here you got all, all the major leagues, baseball, football, basketball, and hockey. No, no, no. We don't want any part of gambling. Don't want any part of gambling. And yet, here it is. After 2018, the Supreme Court of the United States says sports gambling is legal in New Jersey, and they open the gates up for everywhere in the country. Um, the, uh, immediately, New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Mississippi, and New Mexico, Rhode Island joined uh, Nevada in 2018 as sports gambling venues. And there's Chris Christie, and uh, he was the guy who pushed for legalized sports gambling in New Jersey back around 2010. New Jersey voters 2011 said yes to legalized sports gambling. The NFL and the NCAA bought them and caught Fourth them in court, fourth them in court until the Supreme Court ruled the way they did in 2018. Why did they want uh, gambling in New Jersey? Well, to help out the Atlantic City economy. And they were also impressed with Nevada betting numbers. MGM is now an official gaming partner in Major League Baseball. MLB, NFL, NHL, NBA, Major League Soccer, all encourage gambling. So it makes the owners a lot of money in marketing deals. And they think it may spark more interesting games. Uh, could there be a scandal again? 
might happen in minor leagues, maybe college, although college athletes are beginning to get paid through the uh, facial recognition. They could sell their faces now, called the uh, NN, NIL. Anyway, minor league baseball chief, Pat O'Connor, a couple of years ago, was talking about the scenario that could happen. Probably won't, but it could happen. You're in it because there's no money on minor league baseball. You're an A-ball. You got a nice bonus, but you're making $2,000 a month. Guy comes to you and says, hey, kid, throw the first pitch outside. That's all you need to do. You're going to throw 100 more pitches before the night's out. Just make sure the first one's outside. And there's O'Connor. OK, it may not affect the outcome of the game, but now you're old. So you're in your money. You're old. Next time it comes back, it may be something more. Maybe more money. Maybe something more egregious offense. It's your own. A young and impressionable kid is not going to know he needs to be looking over his shoulder for the rest of his career or his life. When you're in the position where this may be my last year and I've never had a good payday and someone offers me something, I'm not saying they would. I would like to pray to God they won't, but it's a real threat. So did these guys bet on baseball and should have they been thrown out? Or did they throw their games? Well, apparently they did throw their games. But where's the evidence? It's lost in the tournament. We don't know. Where's Rothstein? Where's Comiskey? What happened to the evidence? Why was it thrown out? Why was the prosecutor's case? Why did it disappear? The mysteries. The mysteries. There's a book. Eight Men Out came out about 60 years ago. How authentic it is, nobody seems to know. Stories, were they right stories? Nobody seems to know. It was the movie, Eight Men Out, based on the book. Happened 102 years ago, and there are still questions. And you may have questions too. Thank you so much for. Uh, Spending some time with me, going to open it up for some questions or some comments. Go ahead. The floor is yours. I think people have to be unmuted if they want to talk. Hello, hello. Well, if you have a question, type it into the box. I think that might work. Hang on, let me get the question here. Uh, thank you, Noreen. I appreciate that. Just the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. So let me ask you after this thing, what happened? What happened to all the testimony? Where did it go? Comiskey, what happened to the testimony? The prosecutor's case. History's mysteries seems to have